Okay, going to try this screencast a second time since uh, YouTube flagged some of the videos that I played. So if you see any links, just make sure you go into the original um, slideshow and click the links if I refer to them. So the point here, I'm assuming you have read the poems and letters that were in class, and this is designed to give you a uh, point of view of the Vietnam War from the soldier's perspective. If you go to the wall website, which is uh, the Wall Memorial in DC, you are allowed to shade, uh, search your uh, age, your birth date, you know, where you live, uh, just uh, numerous pieces of data uh, to figure out the uh, casualties for any given uh, you know, data entry. For example, I searched 17 years old. So in the Vietnam War, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Americans lost their lives and they were 17 years old. Keep that in mind. You know, some of you, uh, you know, might be 16 years old and, you know, you're just a year away from uh, finding yourselves in the jungles of Vietnam fighting against the uh, Vietnamese. So let's do a quick uh, visual walkthrough here. Uh, imagine you're graduating from high school and you're very excited. You get your diploma. You know, you're on stage, you're, you know, there with all your friends. You know, maybe um, you know, you're thinking back a couple of years ago into life during the 50s, you know, hanging out with your family. And uh, maybe you're somebody who's lost and confused about the future. Um, as the uh, Vietnam War starts to uh, intensify, you see protests. Um, you know, uh, maybe as a result of those protests and the you know, unpopularity of the Vietnam War, your number gets called. What you're looking at here is the draft lottery. And the draft lottery was a way to determine which Americans are going to be drafted to fight in the Vietnam War. Uh, that's kind of what this chart is showing you uh, with the lottery, you know, who's going to be eligible for the draft. So you say goodbye to your loved one, you find yourself in basic training, which is an eight week program to make you uh, a soldier from a civilian. You know, it's a school for warfare. In this eight week program, you will learn how to uh, position your magazines for your rifle. You know, there might be three to four here. You have two, four, six, eight, Maybe let's just say you have three in each. So you have eight up here magazines and three here. That's eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You have uh, 15 if you add the magazine in your clip. But when I talk about magazines, I am talking about magazines that hold bullets. So uh, each magazine you know, holds 30 um, you know, rounds of ammunition. So we take the 30, we multiply by 15, and that number determines how many bullets you have. This is the top of your backpack. You have your canteen and all of this gear is going to be on your person as you walk through the jungle. If you know anything about the Vietnam War, uh, the Vietnam War is all about looking for the enemy, looking for Charlie, the VC. So just imagine you're the soldier and you're walking through this heavy vegetation and you are being asked to find the enemy. Um, what, when did the U.S. decide to go to this conflict to send U.S. troops into this jungle? You have to go back to the Gulf of Tonkin. If you click this link, it's going to take you back to the documentary Fog of War. I encourage you to watch that section on um, you know, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and see what McNamara's points uh, of view, what his point of view happens to be. Uh, later on in life. I wanted you to read the poem, Gulf of Tonkin, which is found in the book uh, from both sides now. It's a collection of poems. And in this one, it talks about 20 phantom torpedoes. I guess the uh, author of this particular piece is questioning whether or not those torpedoes were fired at U.S. ships. Why are those torpedoes so important? Well, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution is what gets the United States troop commitment in Vietnam. Here he talks about two long tables, uh, two okay, uh, tables mightier than aircraft carriers. How can tables be mightier than aircraft carriers? What they're talking about here is uh, how the uh, people in the president's administration are making decisions that are ultimately going to send Americans to war in Vietnam. And one of the men uh, leading that particular advisory committee is Robert McNamara. We've looked at this guy during World War II. Uh, he was the guy trying to figure out how to firebomb Japan. 
We also know that during the Vietnam War, he was trying to fight a war of attrition. This guy has a background in economics. And when we think about a war of attrition, it basically, how do you win a war? We have to kill more than they have, which is why I wanted to use this particular chart. This is how the United States Army groups soldiers. Uh, let's take this one down here, a squad, four to 10 soldiers. Now, a platoon consists of three to four squads. And then a company consists of three to four platoons. When I went through infantry school, one of the things that we were taught was when the United States military attacks, you never attack a platoon with anything less than a company. You never attack a battalion with anything less than a brigade. So why is that important for the Vietnam War? Well, let's just say if you're fighting, um, I don't know, if, if the Vietnamese have, um, you know, uh, let's say three uh, three divisions, which consist of nine brigades, then you are going to have to double up on what you have up here. So just keep that in mind as you keep thinking about the Vietnam War. Basically, this guy's argument is just keep sending more troops. That's how you win the war in Vietnam. Uh, how do you win the war in Vietnam? Send more troops. Uh, okay, well, 4,000 people have died. Send more troops. Anyway. I wanted you to read some letters from the book uh, Shrapnel in the Heart, which is a series of uh, letters that were left at the Vietnam War Memorial. And they're interesting. They tell you a little bit about the story, uh, the war, uh, the moon. For example, here, it's hard to explain how the Vietnam vets are treated. This war is very different from World War II. World War II was uh, more honorable. Uh, that was the view. You know, you, you knew who the enemy was, you knew the Nazis were bad, and it was a tale of, uh, you know, good versus evil. World War One, you're fighting in the trenches. This war is a little different. I mean, it's not a war that seems to be traditional. Uh, here goes another um, letter left. He did not shirk his duty, nor did he take the easy route to Canada. As I mentioned before, people are being drafted, and one way to avoid the draft might be to just uh, try to leave and go to Canada, which is what they're saying here. There is no monument to record his sacrifice in town, nor is his name read on Memorial Day. So again, it's going back to the point about you know, how this war was viewed as a unfavorable war. This sign here, prisoner of war missing in action, you are not forgotten. These are people who are captured during conflict. This man is burning his draft card. And here you see, once again, the draft process. Again, like uh, World War II, at the end of that conflict, you know, we're celebrating. Um, it's just a different war as a result of the social changes, the, the defeat. What were we fighting in that war? When you add events like the My Lai Massacre, uh, these things further complicate the war in Vietnam. You know, as, far, as well as the uh, view of, of the war. Uh, we'll look at the Milai Massacre at a later class. Here's another one uh, that talks about Guy's graduation picture. And in this letter here, the mother is raising her child without a dad. Where is the father? He lost his life in Vietnam. You know, it's not just about one person losing their life. It's about all of those people that know that individual, care for that individual, love that individual. When we look at this particular letter, letter here, uh, what I always point out is years later, you never hear the sound of a helicopter, that they're referencing the helicopter. If you click this link, it will take you to a documentary called Dear America, Letters from Vietnam. There is a section there that goes, uh, you know, it gives you the you know, daily life of a U.S. soldier in Vietnam. And it's pretty easy. You know, you get on the helicopter, you look for the enemy. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Um, and that Vietnam War, um, you know, is leading to a lot of casualties. I mean, you're talking about 58,000 Americans dead, two to four million dead on the Vietnamese side. And this is the Vietnam War Memorial in D.C. that has all of the, you know, loss of life on the U.S. side on this particular uh, structure here. Um, so the, the war in Vietnam, you know, again, referencing the helicopter, which is why here they're saying they can never hear the sound of a helicopter. Um, you know, these are things that remind this individual of the conflict and the loss of life as a result of these individuals you know, dying in that particular conflict. Um, 
So let's take a look at this one. This is a, another poem from the Vietnamese point of view, devotion. And what I like about this one is the last line. If I will use, I will use every breath to raise the banner of independence. Just keep in mind the Vietnamese are fighting for independence. They have driven out the Japanese, the French, um, and they view the U.S. as no other, you know, nothing other than just another uh, nation that stands in their way as they fight for independence, which is why a couple of classes ago I referenced Ho Chi Minh as the George Washington for Vietnam. So this is from the Vietnamese point of view, and just there's a difference. You know, the American soldier is there to, to basically survive. Um, you know, how far are they willing to go? What are they willing to sacrifice in comparison to the Vietnamese that, that are fighting for independence? Um, if we were in class, uh, we would do the uh, Vietnam simulation. So I just included that here as we transition into the section about the um, you know the, the daily life of the soldier. Within one block, I would expect you to leave the high school from the gym, scroll to the road, scroll to the road, go in a wedge formation, walk into this particular area right here, fill out the range card, and then proceed into this village. It sounds easy, but in one class, hour and 20 minutes, you are expected to follow some formations. And I would have spent two classes showing you these formations. I would have went out there the day before and I would have spray painted stuff on the ground, put up wires, put up uh, soda bottles. And then I would have used students from last year to chuck water balloons in your area. And you would be expected to, um, you know, uh, respond militarily to those particular threats. And every time you fail to do that, I would just count, you know, count a casualty and you would be ranked against the other classes to see how many casualties you have in comparison to them. I also would have designated leaders and the leaders would have been responsible for that. So uh, sorry, but you know, we're not able to do it. Um, you know, maybe I'll try to figure out something to do at home, but I just don't see that happening definitely uh, at a disadvantage there. And the reason why I bring that up is the next poem here is Point Man. This guy says he really effed up when he got here. The lieutenant is asking where he's from. You know, two other guys are from Chicago, LA, and he says he's from Wyoming. Says that, um, you know, he was a professional hunting guide, his father. And as a result of that, he winds up being given the task of Point Man. He says here, I should have told him I was from some big smoggy city. So what is the point man? The point man is the lead individual in a wedge formation right here. Here they're using a tank as a point vehicle. So let's go to this image here. This is the point wedge formation. Point man is here. You would have somebody here, another person here. You would be 10 meters apart and leaders would be in the center. So if we were in class, that's this is the formation I would hold you responsible for. And you would be walking one wedge here, one wedge here, and then a staggered formation here. And I would ask you to move within one class around the high school. The problem is, as students throw water balloons in your area, you need to respond. So let's just say somebody throws a water balloon from this direction here. Everybody would have to stop. The leader would have to make a determination, okay, the enemy is here. The leader would then be responsible for telling everybody on this side of the wedge to run full speed to face the enemy. Now everybody is what we call online, facing the enemy. Why is that important? Well, let's just say you were walking in this wedge formation. Somebody fires in this direction, and everybody here fires towards that enemy. Well, they're going to shoot their own people. So your first thing would be you would have to stop. So the, if you want, you know, you could kind of do that as you're sitting here or, you know, maybe stand up. You know, you're walking and um, somebody fires at you. The first thing you would have to do is stop, get on the ground, determine where the person is firing from, which direction, and then move your people up. So let's just say I said, you know, you're walking in this wedge formation and I said uh, two o'clock. That would mean... The fire is coming from 2 o'clock. Where do we get that from? 12, 3, uh, I just forget, 6, 9, 12. It's using the direction of a, of a clock. And they're saying here, like, at 2 o'clock, that's where the perceived enemy is because I said the fire is coming from 2 o'clock, which would mean, as you're, you know, again, you know, if you're, you stand up now and I said 2 o'clock, 
that would mean the enemy is at two o'clock. So just look at the direction of where you think two o'clock would be. The leadership would then have to tell the people on this side of the wedge to run up in this side to face the enemy. So if we go back to our image here, I would probably use about four to six former students, and that's what we would be doing. And I would probably come into class with about 500 water balloons, and you would have none, by the way. It would just be us um, with those things. So keep that in mind. I might also throw a gas, 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 at which point we're back to World War One. We have to put on the gas mask. Anyway, so that's the point, man. So point man would be here, but they're using a tank. And uh, just looking at the tunnels, which we talked about before, you know, this guy could take a shot at this individual, which would be about two o'clock for the people walking in this direction. And then maybe he comes back in here and then takes a shot in this direction. I mean, your ability to move forward would be limited. You know, you wouldn't be able to do that. It just would be too complicated and time consuming, which is the whole point of the war. Keep in mind, you would be walking through this dense jungle, which is why I would have you actually walking through this wooded area right here. So I'm trying to recreate, you know, this particular environment here. Coming through the boonies is another one, poem here. I like this one. It sums up the soldier um, point of view. Get down. A sniper's round ricochets to the right. So they're saying here, like, get down. They're walking through. A sniper's round. An RD is a bullet. It's ricocheting to the right. So they believe from the direction that they're standing that the bullet is coming from the right. Where? Anyone got it? Off to the left. The tree line. 11 o'clock. No, to the front. Rate the tree line. Nothing. They're saying so much in this section. And you got to keep in mind that this is happening in like a second or two. These guys are walking. Somebody takes a shot. And your first thing is everybody get down. Yeah, you're in water. Get down. We need to figure out where that person's coming from. You know, they're saying 11 o'clock to the left, to the right. And he says, rake the tree line. Well, what does that mean? That means let's try to just unload all of our bullets into this tree area to see if we hopefully hit the enemy. Spread out. Keep your distance. More harassment than anything. Getting down in the dirt. Sucking dust all afternoon. Another round. Another hundred yards. Heavy pack. Hot helmet. Sweat pouring into the eyes. So here, you know, they were fired at here. Now they're being fired at again. And uh, that so far seems to be their day. Um, here he says, check out the hedge grow. So thick Bangalore wouldn't make a dent. What he's saying there is if he unloaded all of his ammunition, his 250 rounds of ammo, he would not even put a dent in this hedge grow. This is the hedge grow. He's talking about the vegetation. Uh, where are we at? Uh, here he says, another round, two, three, AK by the sound. They, they've been fired at here, here, over here. He says, another round, two, three. So that means that they, three rounds were fired. And AK is a reference to a Soviet-made AK-47. And just think about it, by the sound of the bullet, the you know, what he hears, he's already concluding that this is a AK-47. Like, that's how good and precise this guy is. Here he talks about getting into the hamlet late at afternoon. What's a hamlet? A hamlet is a Vietnamese village. Don't take no shit today. Too many days exactly like this. He's annoyed. He was fired at here. He's fired at here. He's fired at here. And so they've just entered this village. Uh, get up. Nothing. They're gone. Nobody there except women, kids, and a few dogs. So in this village, keep in mind, women, kids, a few dogs. But the village is close to where they were fired at here, here, and here. So what would you assume? Would you assume that these people in this village have any idea where the enemy is? Is it possible that the people in that village were taking fire at you? And so he says here, um, Zippo Diplomacy, which means they are going to use a Zippo lighter to burn down the village, which is what's going on. And he says here, um, call it in ETA LZ Red 1715. Move it out. Here are them birds. This is an estimated time of arrival, landing zone red, 515, move it out, which means that the helicopters, the birds, are going to pick them up at 515 at this particular location. So their day of humping through the boonies consisted of getting fired at, fired at, fired at. They entered a village, nobody knows where the enemy is, and they proceeded to burn down the village, which creates you know, that unpopularity for this particular conflict. You might want to take a look at these clips here, Forrest Gump. Uh, there are some scenes in there 
take a search, uh, do a search on YouTube for Napalm Girl and just some clips for the Vietnam War as you uh, proceed. As I said, YouTube has flagged this video already, so hopefully they won't do it again. Um, you know, and you should have read also the Guerrilla War poem, The End. It's practically impossible to tell a civilian from the Viet Cong. After a while, you quit trying. And that's why we have so many massacres in Vietnam. It's a result of this weird fighting. And again, the Vietnamese are doing what they have to do in order to win. Whether that's going into the tunnels, another poem talking about the tunnels, or that's, um, you know, taking a shot and hiding. And that's it.